The Croton Institute, plus Nourish and a number of other partners, recently got a USDA grant to figure out how to pay farmers more than only for yield. So a check-in interview is due with David and David, who have been working in the regeneration and nourishing economy space forever. What's the lay of the land when it comes to nutrient density and diversity, connecting soil health and human health? What are they seeing? What is exciting them? And why did the USDA fund their work with $600,000? What are the connections between healthy farming practices, healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut and healthy people? Welcome to a special series where we go deep into the relationship between regenerative agriculture practices that build soil health and the nutritional quality of the food we end up eating. We unpack the current state of science, the role of investments, businesses, nonprofits, entrepreneurs and more. This series is supported by the A-Team Foundation, who support food and land projects that are ecologically, economically and socially conscious. They contribute to a wider movement that envisions a future where real food is produced by enlightened agriculture and access to it is equal. The A-Team Foundation are looking to make more investments and grants in the space of bionutrients. You can find more here, ateamfoundation.org, or get in touch directly, info at ateamfoundation.org, or check the information in the show notes below. Welcome to another episode today with David and David, David Azex of the Croton Institute and David Strelnack of Nourish. So I'm very excited to unpack the nutrient density side of things. But as uh, David has been, uh, David Azex has been on the show three and a half years ago, I think we need to, to do a new introduction and other David hasn't been in the show ever. So we need to do a proper introduction there as well. So let's start with David, who has been on already uh, to briefly introduce, I'll put a link below, obviously, on the Soil Wealth Report you wrote with the Croton Institute and many of the other amazing work, but uh, describing in a few sentences or a few more your work at the moment and, and what brings you to soil would be great. Thank you for having me. Good to be here again. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, based in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, work with the Croton Institute, a uh, nonprofit working to leverage finance to create pathways to a just economy. And uh, since we were on the show in 2019 talking about the soil wealth report, investing in regenerative agriculture across asset classes, clearly been busy with a number of other reports uh, across the space uh, and, and other projects as well, including a, a conservation innovation grant uh, funded by the USDA uh, to develop soil wealth areas that we just finished up in a report coming out on that soon. Uh, we were actually, actually uh, we did a quick, uh, yeah, quick interview with I, you. Yeah, I just remembered we did a webinar. We did a, a Q&A. Oh, my <laughs> God. We had a Q&A with That's my really colleague bad. Mandy Ellerton on our uh, regenerative great. agriculture yeah. and human health uh, report that came Nexus. out in 2021. Yep. Uh, we had a report on investing in regenerative ag infrastructure that was also mm -hmm. uh, you know clearly uh, related to the subject area. We've done other reports with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, WBCSD, on investing in soil. Uh, and then we're working on building this new soil wealth community and it's specifically focused on uh, uh, developing de-risking, financial de-risking mechanisms to help transition regen to more regenerative agriculture. And in other places in Croton Institute, uh, my colleague Charlene Brown's leading work on redirecting capital to accelerate racial equity. So our work is not just in agriculture and soil and health, as we'll talk about here, but really across this spectrum of how we can leverage finance to create pathways to more just economy. Perfect. And other David, welcome to the show. And could you, I mean, you've been working together for, for over 10 years and we're going to dive into that, but could you briefly introduce yourself as well? Yeah, thank, thank you. Really happy to be here. Um, my name is David Strelnick. I founded and lead an organization called Nourish at www.nourishn.com. The N is an exponent, Nourish to the nth degree. And that's and because nourish.com was already taken or not. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> when you see the logo, you'll love it. Um, so, uh, gosh, I've spent about 30 years helping design and implement environmental initiatives in many parts of the world. And uh, I'm trained in environmental policy and environmental economics. And about 10 years ago, um, in the course of that work with a lot of social entrepreneurs in a lot of different countries, we begin to see a pattern of success that really said that the entrepreneurs who are linking the health of the land with the health of people were just unbundling all kinds of value. 
and 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 the you know the system the systems thinkers amongst them were really um, turning that value into phenomenal enterprises and initiatives and approaches. And so I launched my current organization coming out of that body of work to try to help spread that economic model in the world. Um, I met David Lazax about ten years ago in the course of this work before before words like regenerative agriculture were being used. I was interviewed by Ozzy seven years ago with them saying, what do you think of this term? And I was like, well, it's interesting. It sort of describes some of what we're doing, you know? And um, so David and I have been on a path for a long time through different organizations and, 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 and projects together um, towards this sort of shared goal, I think, of, of, of a better world where the life of people and the life of, of the earth itself are, are, are thriving. Uh, based on relationships with each other, so that's what I work on, and and yeah. I think we can spend a whole other episode unpacking a, a lot of the work, which we will do. Um, but in this case, you've been working like together on different projects for ten years, and recently got uh, a significant USDA grant to work on this nutrient density piece, um, or the soil health and the connection to human health. And what does that work? entail and why is it so relevant now and also actually why is the usda now funding that like what has changed because 10 years ago nobody knew the term region ag let alone nutrient density in this whole i mean of course in the original organic space 100 years ago this this was all very clear and probably in indigenous knowledge a few thousand years ago everybody knew this and and acted on it but we're rediscovering a lot let's say and why suddenly now is there funding to do work around this this specific topic or this very broad but this specific term let's say well well from a the broad perspective uh usda eh, they haven't fully accepted or are promoting re the term regenerative agriculture it comes up here and there uh, but as you've you've probably seen, and many of your many of your listeners have probably seen the climate smart agriculture grants, a couple billion dollars for those. Um, you know, this work is hosted out of the um, uh, NRCS Natural Resources. Uh, uh, so climate smart as a term is less contagious than regenerate. That's interesting, though. It it's interesting. It it's it it's a term that makes the least amount of people anxious how's that angry yeah uh, yeah so the natural resources conservation service their primary objective is really around these natural resources around soil even soil health is something that you know even over the last 10 years they've just begun to adopt that terminology before that it was soil quality you know so it's, it's really been an evolution within within usda and we've been successful um, in a number of these kind of competitive grant processes, first uh, with the Soil Wealth Report grant uh, in, that we started in 2017 to 2019, then the Soil Wealth Area Report uh, and project, and now with this new collaboration with David, we got uh, $690,000 uh, from USDA to identify, to show, to explore to I don't want to say prove is maybe a you know too far of a um, a stretch, but what we've identified with uh, with the work that's going on in this space now is that I think that there's clearly more to learn and there's clearly more to to unpack and to understand of the the relationship between how we grow our food and what the nutritional qualities and characteristics of that food are. That those relationships are there, which I think just being able to say that is something we may not have been able to say in some cases, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. But the question for us is now, so what do we, what, what's going to happen because of that new or rekindled knowledge? And the NRCS's perspective is if you can use specifically market drivers or investment or movement of capital in one way or another to get more conservation on the ground, great. Because what we do through, or what they do, the NRCS does specifically through their EQIP um, uh, project, uh, project and, and um, program to kind of get money, cost share dollars to farmers to implement conservation practices, cover crop and no-till and alley cropping and agroforestry and managed grazing, all of these you can get cost share money through. And that's usually how they spend their money. But the this conservation innovation grant program, the intent is if you can figure out another way 
that we that these dollars will be leveraged to unlock more conservation on the landscape, then that's the bar that we have to get over in order to make these grants and these projects successful. And so what does the work entail? So basically your your bar is okay, if we pay farmers directly to um, to do cover crops or other practice changes, um, we know what we get more or less. And in this case, like let's try to figure out another route to to India or another route to to get to where we want to be. Um, they don't know, of course, we don't know how that would look like, like paying for quality is not a, a known thing, except maybe in wine um, and, and maybe some very small other niches. So what, like, how do you even start? It, exactly. And in our, in, in the, I went back before this, the recording of this episode and looked at our, our proposal and what we said we would do. And we said that today's agricultural food market doesn't value the myriad of outcomes from conservation. It's not internalized into prices and incentives that come from the market. And so our job in you know this two-year project is to figure out what those, you know, what drives these prices, what new or different incentives are, and how not only new market structures might be set up, but what's the relationship then between uh, uh, financial institutions who are extending uh, credit or to investors who are investing in businesses, how, how does that thesis get unpacked and how does it actually, how, how does regenerative agriculture become bankable, not just because of the environmental aspects of conservation, but of the nutritional and human health aspects of conservation as well. And I, th I think this is David S. Um, and part of, part of what this this funding from USDA is allowing us to do is is lend some structure and formality to a number of the other economic side values that are created through these types of farming practices that are often not recognized or they're only recognized locally. They're very place based, and yet they have immense economic value. So if we if we go into what we mean by health in a community community relationships, local food system resilience when a economic shock comes along, right? Local e ecological resilience, water system, clean water and water quality systems that provide clean drinking water to lots of people that that survive better if the land has been managed in certain ways. Um, cultural values and traditions amongst, you know, substantial groups of people. Um, all of this is economic. It drives behavior and value in society. And it's completely, well, almost completely off the radar of those who look at it from afar and try to put it on the spreadsheet and say, well, what's the what's the value of the output that's being produced? And so um, another thing this grant is giving us the opportunity to do is to take not those ideas, not only those ideas, but e each of the things I just listed and more are represented in actual enterprises we work with. In the, in the coalition I help coordinate around the world. And so these are real. Each one of these is <laughs> very specific and real, but not at all generalized. So it's giving us a chance to sort of roll back the economics a little bit and say, okay, all of these economic values are related to each other and how the land is being managed by the farmers. And food quality is clearly, can clearly be at the forefront of those economic drivers. But when you farm that way, you get this whole additional package of economic services. And uh, how can we activate that in the world in ways that reward farmers for managing land this way with, with climate smart benefits and nutritional quality benefits, but also this other range of, of, of benefits in their communities and society more generally. Um, so I think part of, couldn't part of just, Part of a response to your question is we made that pitch to USDA. Like, and there's like, a lot more. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, really? You think so? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, there's some early, there's some such, I think there's a paper somewhere, for sure, you know, many more, but like on um, successful organic farms lead to better, I am going to say slightly higher job wages, like nearby and, and also more other successful organic farms. I give the spillover effect of organic farms. And there are some of this early suggestion. Of course, you have the, the successful examples like white oak pastures. I don't know. I mean, 180 people on the the payroll. Like that. That's probably not. Like that's a big cost, but at the same time, local community wise, very interesting of a town that that 
probably has less than that. Um, like the impact on housing, the impact on the local coffee place, the impact on the school, the impact on, I mean, is, is massive, but you would never see that on your, your investment balance sheet. Um, if, if you did that loan to, to Will Harris, I mean, you would never see that, you would never count that in. So is that your yeah. goal like to understand those kind of other benefits or how does that tie into, to quality or where, okay, you, you won the grant and now like what, what are you now going to do? Uh, as you want to pitch, but now, of course, the work starts. Let me just say that uh, you were referring to the 2016 study put out by Penn State, uh, and also, I think, in collaboration with the Organic Trade Association that showed organic hotspots in the U.S. had higher, uh, and there was an increase in median household incomes and a reduction in local poverty levels because of these hotspots of organic agriculture. So which is fascinating. Put that okay, in the show we, notes. Can, we can we can put it in the show notes. I was of course referring to that one and I didn't remember the exact details of it. Yeah. So thank you for um, for quickly checking that because that's interesting. Like that's that it's very narrow focus but it's still very significant if done well. I don't know the study of course but I think that um your your question highlights two aspects of our work. So there is there's this USDA grant within the body of our broader mission. My organization's broader mission is to spread these economic principles in the world, right? So, yes, let's go help that happen in a lot more places, right? Um, um, let me give you one more example that comes from the early days of our work. Gosh, eight or nine years ago, um, we started working with a, a group in Western Ireland called Burren Life, the Burren Project. Which basically Burren is in burning, burning, or yeah, no, no, Burren, the region ah, of okay. Ireland, B U R R E N, uh, Burren Life dot something. Um, I will find it. Yeah, um, and uh, led led by a close colleague of mine now, um, who the short story would be he set out to uh, uh, stop the degradation of traditional sheep farms and wildflower biodiversity in this. Uh, ecologically and culturally rich part of Ireland, where a lot of the famous Western poetry was written and all of these things, but where sort of the growth of uh, volume-based sheep farming was degrading all kinds of things. Um, we can tell the story later of how he went about it, but the success is <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and it, it worked in part by incentivizing sheep farmers to restore fields with fewer sheep and more biodiversity in ways that drew in more tourists to the region, which then reinvigorated the inns and the bed and breakfasts in town and lots of the other economics of the whole region. So that the whole region then began to subsidize the sheep farmers because they are producing fewer sheep, but they're bringing an immense economic benefit to everybody, right? It's a really exciting and compelling model. Um, it's led by a man named Basically the underlying, the underlying notion, which, it's ridiculous that we don't think about it more often, but a healthy land leads to healthy communities and healthy people and economies. And unless you have healthy land, unless you're a sea-based economy, like everything else sort of falls apart. Yep. Yep. Um, slowly and, or, and so or quickly. In many cases, slowly. So we don't really see it. We're sort of used to degradation landscapes around us, but we don't really see, yeah, see the, the, the destruction. Well, and, and if you, if you take the lens of diversity, it, you begin to see things differently too. You begin to realize how diversity of species and economics and all these things it begin to interplay in this complex system that really are often left out of more linear economics. <laughs> I'm going to invest in this to get this return, right? Um, and and another offside is, is there are even some sea-based economies now where we're seeing these dynamics come to play. I'll say in the United States, in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, we have increasing examples of um, of seaweed farming, right, to produce micronutrient-rich soil amendments on the land. We also have examples of big efforts to restore s uh, wild salmon migration up rivers, um, in part because uh, it's become clear that when millions of salmon migrate from the ocean up the river and die after they breed, they're transporting nutrients from the ocean back into the land. Right? And there's a big nutrient cycle thing going on that was broken by the damming up of a lot of rivers. 
50 which has to be restored. Ago. Otherwise, we have to truck it up. Yeah. <laughs> which is so these six, the, yeah. Um, within the context of our U.S. Department of Agriculture grant, then, <laughs> right, which isn't to look at all of that, but it is. it does give us the opportunity to to focus in and say, okay, what are the implications of these of these observations of economics and value propositions that are actually at play, right? And can we can we get them on a single list? Can we correlate them with food quality production, right? And so can not we just organic certified? Like yeah, like how, yeah. How no, so actually yeah. Un, under this grant, we have a we have a what we call our reference framework now that lists about. 38 farming practices involving soil and the surrounding ecosystem and seed selection, right? And cultivar selection and management that correlate one way or another with some aspect of food quality, phytonutrient production, micronutrient production, uh, uh, reduction in toxicity of the food. But each of these farming practices has a clear and direct connection, though not quantified in detail by science yet. And so then part of the thesis of our grant is that as you look at the farming practices that produce that higher quality food, you can look at the other economic benefits, those same farming practices we're also producing at the same time. And we can begin to say, okay, if the same thing that produced higher quality phytonutrient production through either... uh, soil management or use of natural pollinators, right? Those same things are producing a more vibrant ecosystem, higher carbon retention, right? Can those economics be packaged and handed to a farmer in a way that gets them really excited, not just morally, but financially? Like, this is a really good business to be in. Like, I'm going to start getting paid for all these benefits I'm producing. And is that payment then coming from, like, the myriad of different programs that is the USDA or others are already handing out, already paying for a, a flower or biodiversity lane here and there, or like, is, is this also a potential effort to bundle a lot of those things? Or what, what is the result? Um, is it an advice? Is it a pilot or experimentational um, outcome as well? Or what, what, what is an ideal result look like? What does an I ideal mean, David, you like? should address that, but, but I think of it as a discovery process. We're not trying to construct we're trying to discover. You're not doing transactions, where, yeah. Yeah, where, where where is the demand? Where is the supply? What what economic models or mechanisms or approaches in, in the private sector, in the public sector, wherever are actually putting this into play? And, and I think that gets to the the broader question of how do we move from a food system based on quantity to one based on quality, and that that's. We're clearly not the first ones to say that. We've heard that from Dan Kittreds of Bionutrient Food Association. We've heard that from Eric Smith of Audacious and the Grantham Foundation and, and many others in this in this field who see that just the the weight or the size or the amount of food is is not the sole characteristic or one of the few characteristics that we should be transacting on. And if we realize there's this difference and a differentiation of many different quality aspects of that food, including ones that are related to not just short-term health, but long-term health, then how do those play into the transactions that happen every day when somebody, you know, when, when two people or two organizations get together to transact around this, uh, around food? And from the perspective of of USDA, you know, they're interested in kind of more on the production side that, you know, they do have some, you know, consumer uh, facing, um, uh, you know, parts of that government agency. But, you know, you look at the health side and that's in the health and human services division. Uh, And many, many governments and even many markets are really uh, siloed in this way where, uh, and even, you know, for me coming from a, you know, PhD in environmental science, I've looked at food from the lens of its environmental outcomes most of my career until one day on a, on a walk with some colleagues, I said, well, Earth Day was like 50 years ago. And yeah, there's no more Dust Bowl, but we have, have we gotten as far as we need to as it relates to this relationship between 
how we do agriculture, what you know, what the damage or repair to our landscapes, uh, you know, how that's shaping up, and what's happening to people in all of this. F- fundamentally, we do agriculture to feed people, and uh, uh, thank you, David, for this terminology, and to nourish them. Uh, to stay healthy. And I think that role of food in society more broadly, I think we've lost some of that. I think we've lost, you know, the, the, the central role of taste and aroma and, um, you know, how we feel and treat food. You know, we know that we spend like the least amount on food than we have, at least in the, in the, in the U S and in many other Western, uh, nations, than we have throughout most of history and spend the least amount of time working with that food. And there's been severe implications for that. And I think that, you know, a lot of this is coming up again through the Dave Montgomery and Ann Bickley book, through the the Rockefeller Foundation led report last year on the true cost of food. You know, that was that was, you know, for me in this journey, something that really just, you know, put a put a pin in uh, you know, knowing that we were on the right track in terms of, uh, you know, their work, uh, talking about the $1.1 trillion that are, are spent on food ex- or that are expended on food in the U S there's a, this is a U.S. Um, based study. Um, but there was an additional $2.1 trillion of additional costs, uh, related to food and food production and consumption. And of those $2.1 trillion of cost, about half of them, $1.1 trillion were related to human health. So we know that we're growing food and we know that the chief impact area is in health. It's not on the environment, which is actually surprising to me. And I think is surprising to a lot of other people that where there's, you know, we're talking about carbon labels and we're talking about riparian buffers as it relates to food production, but it's really the impacts are on the health balance sheet less so it's, it's they're still there but uh, you know it's clearly on the environmental balance sheet but the primary impact primary negative impact of food production is on health and i think that from a consumer and market perspective focusing in on supporting and developing enterprises and business cases around developing a more regenerative agriculture that benefits human health in addition to the environment is a way that may gain traction faster with consumers and in the marketplace than a purely environmental message that uh, still may resonate, but maybe Hasn't not as strong far, as the health yeah. one. <laughs> and, and for you, David, as what when did that click in terms of the connection of healthy soil to healthy produce, healthy gut system, healthy people, and then of course, healthy ecosystems. Do you remember, yeah. was that a process? Was it a moment? Was it a walk like other David? Yeah, there's, there's, again, there's, there's this backstory, um, that, that comes out of the world of social entrepreneurship, um, that frequently sort of operates, uh, with groups like Ashoka or the Skoll Foundation or others, right. Who are sort of in parallel with, but not really synchronized with the more traditional uh, disciplines, right? So of uh, engineering and science and economics, you know, like, so I spent a lot of years working with like the so- social entrepreneurs. And so seven or eight years ago, we convened a conference in Frankfurt, Germany, with a couple of hundred of these Ashoka and Skoll fellows from around the world, who had built successful initiatives, private or public sector, that looked to me like they were connecting the nutritional health of the land to nutritional health of people. That isn't necessarily how the social entrepreneur talked about it, right? They, Brendan in Ireland talked about bringing back wildflower biodiversity so that our ancestors would be happy with us again. He's, a, he's spot on. It's his initiative. That's the one I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. But if I look at it, I'm saying, what you're doing is you're c- cycling nutrients. <laughs> That's another lens on the exact same work, right? So um, we, we spent several years and several million dollars of the Gates Foundation's money uh, through Ashoka looking for successful innovators in rural economies around the world. This was, this was eight or nine years ago. And it took five years to find 100 that met the 
the rigorous Ashoka criteria for being a system-changing social entrepreneur who had actually demonstrated a new idea that had never been done before. When you find a hundred of those people, you get them in the room together, and they sort of Fire. tell you, <laughs> look, look, here's what's going on. Healthier people come from healthier land, <laughs> right? So, so it, that, that idea began to crystallize back then. There was a specific uh, enterprise and product developed in South Africa called EPAP. EPAP is a uh, traditional, traditional staple in a lot of the meals served, and EPAP was an innovation around it that um, um, uh, developed, invented by a social entrepreneur named Basil Kransdorf. Basil has since passed away, but he did a great service to the world, I think. Um, and uh, what he did was developed a, a version of this food supplement that's like a porridge or a powder. This is, this is what really crystallized it for me, right? Um, that when, when, when included in the diet of children who were in health clinics because they were suffering illness of tuberculosis or HIV AIDS or other things, the children consuming the meals that included this porridge responded to the traditional medicines better than the same cases in the same clinic who weren't being fed that meal. They were being fed the traditional meal. So the question began to arise, why? What's going on with this magic powder <laughs> that's got these, these children coming, you know, their immune systems are responding more effectively to the medicine they're being given, right? And the, the long story made very short, or maybe I'm being very long, is um, Basil said, you know, all I know is we didn't refine the grains. We didn't ultra process them or biofortify them. We just included all the organic matter in from naturally raised, you know, foods in the porridge that we manufacture. And s something's going on. <laughs> and and uh, I'm not going to wait around and try to prove what that something is. I don't care. Children are getting healthier faster. <laughs> I'm going to put all my time and energy into producing this product and getting the world to accept some of these principles, right? That's really when, for me, the sort of the, I mean, he, because I come from the environmental side and he sort of said, look, there's the direct health benefit of eating healthy, fiber-rich, organic food with all the stuff in there that we don't understand. Um, and, and he created a very successful enterprise out of it. Um, and, and in this case, it was, because often in this, examples it's it's not necessarily it doesn't talk about how it's been grown but in this case it was grown like like this is could be a case of non-processing instead of only soil that's health. correct but in yep. this case you trace it up back all the way down to different soil practices as well or what was the what was the difference in the processing or in the in the yeah. farming side you know all all i know right now is 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 the stories that basil told okay and which was that they sourced organically produced yeah. foods but i don't even know if that means certified organically right or mm -hmm. or what um but so part of the, the ingredient and the processing that made i the think difference. so yeah. personally and i and now again even with this u.s department of agriculture grant you know it's, it's taken many years of trying to convince some funders to spend uh, put attention on this i mean the the grantham foundation ignored me five and six and seven and eight years ago for suggesting that this is something that you should be focusing on, right? I'm so excited that in more recent years they and and you know they 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 they've taken up that 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 mantra. Um, but one of the one of the interesting things to think about, perhaps from an investor's perspective or a nutrient density perspective, both of those, which you've said you're interested in, right, or your audience is, um, is um, a what happens when you get the entrepreneurs in the room together and let them do the thinking, maybe frame the question. And so we, we, in that conference I told you about in Frankfurt that we organized, we had Basil from South Africa. We had Brendan from Ireland. <laughs> we had Sylvia from Zambia. We had Marta from Ecuador. And, and they each come from a different part of the story. And, and getting them in a room for a couple of days, you know, things happen that would never come out of a more linearly planned conference or an analytic process. So there's there's something there about where you want to put your funding, perhaps, or some of the funding, if you really want to spark new ideas and actions and approaches. Um, the other piece, let me just say briefly, is that something that that group and 
subsequently in the science research we've done and in certainly in the economic side, um, um, you know, we shied away for many years from the term nutrient density because it seemed to indicate increased density of certain nutrients. Whereas what we saw at play was this diversity question again. We started talking about nutrient spectrum, the different types of nutrients, the relationships between those nutrients, the interplay of all of that in your, your gut, for your gut health, which then begins to correlate with every other aspect of your health, right? Um, so, so there's a question here about, okay, what do we mean by density, right? And, and I'm a, you know, I'm on, on, you know, I'm on paper, um, arguing, you know, it's, 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 it's diversity. Not the perfect term. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so where are we now? Like we're at the beginning of 2023, what are, it's early, of course, in, in the grant work as well, but what are the big opportunities you see or, or what is ripe for innovation or ripe for entrepreneurship now at the beginning of, of uh, 2023 that maybe wasn't possible five years ago? What, what are interesting places that you're excited about based on the work you're doing now with the UCA, but of course also on the 10 plus years, you have been looking at a lot of these things. And I'm curious about both of your answers. Like what, what excites you now on, on, on this quality piece or nutrient spectrum piece that, that, is, uh, that is starting to, seems to be at least bubbling faster than I've seen it doing in a long time. I think that there are a number of new entrepreneurs who are using the messaging around nutrients, nutrition, and health that are bringing products to market that I think is very interesting. And, and we're looking very closely in, in conversation with some of those entrepreneurs. I think there's a fire hose of data that is just getting turned on, which some of those entrepreneurs are, are using. And I can give some examples in, in, in a moment. And then, and then I think there's this broader market question around how we begin to transact around these quality metrics of food in ways that is different than, than how we have in the past. So for instance, uh, Costarina is uh, an olive oil company that is using their management practices and they're picking the olives at a certain time to increase the antioxidant uh, composition of their olive oil. Um, there's, there was some interesting work done with Dan Barber and Jill Clapperton around the, the wheat variety that he thought as a chef tasted better and Jill came in uh, from a measurement science perspective and said, actually, there's more nutrients in this compared to other types of wheat. Um, uh, a new company uh, or new products by a company called Big Bold Health that's introducing Himalayan tartary buckwheat to the market uh, in, in its multitude of kind of health benefits from uh, increased antioxidants and polyphenol uh, composition of that food. Uh, Pasture Bird uh, on its website, a pasture poultry company out of California, uh, it says, you know, three times the amount of omega 3s, 50% more vitamins, 21% less saturated fat. And m more, in most interesting to us is um, we're a part of this project. We're actually working with Dan Kittredge and the Bionutrient Food Association. Uh, they have this uh, beef study going on with Stefan Van Vliet of Utah State University looking at the... We just had on and should be out when, when you're listening to this. And we have Paul of Pasture Bird <laughs> next week. So let, let's... Uh, oh, awesome. Uh, let's, I had no idea. I promise. Names. I promise. No, no. But these, 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 <laughs> are the space. These, these are the people yeah. who are, are at, the, at the cutting edge. Um, and so we're working with them to kind of uh, get... Uh, grass-fed beef producers to um, to to sample their 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 soil, the uh, um, uh, animal poop, the and the, the animal and the sorry the the soil, the grass, the manure, and and the meat, and looking at the nutritional composition of uh, and the microbiomes of of all of those different things. And uh, one pr producer, uh, Carter Country Meats, on their LinkedIn site, right at the top, says, "We are 64% more nutrient dense than other grass-fed beef companies, and 239% more than grain-finished beef." So it's really interesting, I think, from a, you know from our perspective of seeing where these data are being used when you begin to arm these which could uh, be just like really a complete outlier uh, in the study let's let's i mean it's fascinating <laughs> to see it but it's scary 
as well to see those numbers there. Well, I, 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 am not, I am not judging or, or yeah. placing value Neither. on that yet. I'm simply observing that once the data are out there, people will begin to use them. And, you know, and Stefan, either he did tell you or he, I, I'm sure he told you that, the, the, you know, the data that they've collected so far is preliminary and they're looking to get more data and the, you know, science is, you know, the, that chapter is not closed yet. But once you start to generate data, people are going to use it. Um, and course, then there's, yeah. you, know, you know, I know you had Blue Blancour, uh, you know, on the show a couple of years ago. Uh, David Strelnack worked very closely uh, with an entrepreneur named uh, Zoe Finch Totten when she had a company called The Full Yield, which was one of the early kind of food as medicine companies. Um, and was it, as in closed was as in closed as, 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 okay. and the main reason being that it she had started that company right before the the economic crash of 2010 um 28 2010 um uh, so there's a there's a there's a story there it, it was a it was a a or maybe the early example of the of the insurance the health insurance industry and putting forth real resources to maintain the health of the people they insured so that there would be fewer claims, health claims. Seems to make right? a lot of sense. Yeah. It, right. The logic is is compelling. It, you know, it, it elevated its way through a case study at Harvard Business School. So it has some credibility, right? Um, and um, but the macroeconomics fell apart. The whole market exploded. The, yeah. the the marginal funding that those insurance companies and others had to put into this sort of thing, everything right collapsed back then. Uh, so she's still very active, but that's the was in the story. It's like, we, we think it the was was. Will, will she be back? That's the question. I mean, I don't think she can let go. Stay, yeah. stay tuned, I guess, is the answer to that. <laughs> stay tuned, but, yeah. But, but, so there's stuff happening, stuff failing, obviously, or not succeeding. and and But it seems like, yeah, it, it's buzzing. It and is. as it, re and as it relates to capital, as part of the last year, there was a White House summit on health, nutrition, and hunger. Uh, a group of private sector investors announced the launch of the Food, Nutrition, and Health Investor Coalition and pledged to catalyze $2.5 billion into this space. Um, and so, you know, we're tracking not just the entrepreneurship side, but what are, what are the companies and the investors kind of where are they dipping their toes in or where are they going in whole hog uh into the space and i think that the you know insurance companies as they worked with um the full yield as an example there's another example of uh john hancock insurance providing you know food boxes and i think this is this you know broader conversation around you know food is medicine um you know we see some opportunities to refine the food is medicine approach to not just work for people who are already sick, but work as a preventative medicine approach. Um, that, 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 but it's these examples where we're seeing this, this where we were, where there used to be a siloing of agriculture and food and health. We're now seeing them being drawn closer and closer together. And we see I think or one of the things that we're looking for and are hoping to more actively or are, are more actively engaging in is how do we begin to get the capital that's flowing into healthcare and into food and agriculture not see themselves as being different as well. Because let's face it, there's a lot of money flowing in healthcare, either there's as cost, healthcare costs or investments in all kinds of biotech stuff and things like that, and hardly ever looking at the underlying health conditions or the, the reasons for being like, is there any progress there as well? Like David, you wanted to say something? Yeah, well, I did a couple more examples related to your question also of where's the buzz, right? Where Where's the excitement? But, but keying back to a, a critical question that I think you, this conversation touches on, which is where's the consumer demand? Okay, we we just listed, David just listed a number of really exciting production side, <laughs> producer side, product side, supply side examples. But where's the consumer side, demand side action? And I think that's a super important question to be asking, right? Um, let me say that uh, from my perspective, a piece of the of what should be the exciting buzz, if you take that ten year frame, is that we even have language to discuss this. We have we can now argue about it. I mean, five years ago, we would we would convene people and they would look at each other in the room because we didn't even know how to talk to each other about some of these ideas. 
Now we do. That's real progress. We may not be agreeing, we may not have reached conclusions, but we now have language and ideas to, you know, to 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 think critically about and argue about, and that's that's what's going to spark uh, some of the innovation and progress. Um, the other thing, I so I, I mean, I'm I'm I want to see more consumer side demand, right? I don't have an answer to that question, but that's part of what our USDA grant is helping us explore, right? Where are the segments and the differentiation where you actually have consumers picking up these products, institutional consumers, individual consumers, what are the demographics of those consumer groups and what and why and how, and at what price points? This all matters. I think another piece of the buzz that that is understood conceptually and is finally starting to be applied is the world of big data and AI for correlating some of the outcomes of these farming practices because the 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 reductionist linear scientific approach of trying to prove them you know what one would at be a an time. example of that in terms of well well so, so the big example yeah. the 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 pot of gold I think at the end of the rainbow maybe is when the healthcare sector is able to say we definitively see that because we have enough data now that that human health is better on these metrics when people eat those kind of foods. And those and, kind, like, is that then all the way tied to, because we had Elizabeth, ooh, I'm blanking on her name, David is much better at this, um, on basically providing organic meal boxes to people coming out of the hospital after severe uh, surgery, et cetera, and mm -hmm. not connecting necessarily to the soil health. Like how much of this is, simply getting rid of a lot of processed food and just eating better? Like how much is needed or is it really fundamental to look at the soil health piece? I mean, for the environmental outcomes, yes, because you can still farm organically yep. and harm the soil. Like that, there's no discussion there. But for the health outcome, have you, like how crucial is that connection to the soil? Or is it simply getting rid of a lot of things and, and getting eating a lot better is good enough? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a scientist or a medical doctor. I've watched this stuff for a long time, right? Um, and so I think um, I don't think we know the answer, and I think there's different layers of the analysis, right? We we and 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 one of those and some of those base are based on your your economic status, your socioeconomic status, and your ethnicity in some cases. Which foods are better for you? Uh, what's your you know? Do you have access to the foods you need, etc.? And so there's got to be different layers of intelligence to thinking about that but um, we do now know that certain farming practices do create different health attributes in the foods higher antioxidant levels um, different micronutrient profiles in some cases different fatty acid profiles in some cases we this is right and it's it's early but it's evidence it's clearly true and so I think a, an, an inquiry. The question is: Okay, within that within that layer, does it matter, <laughs> or do all these other things matter more? Is it just more important just to eat a diverse diet, right? Um, and and uh, a fresh food. I mean, we've diet seen data or on a that, local of course. Diet. Yeah, with, yeah, with Zach Bush's work on, on many of his patients who got sicker, even though they ate kale and broccoli, um, yeah. is isn't really helpful. So, are there specific crops or part of this massive food system you're focusing on? I mean, you mentioned beef and pasture bird and like and, and olive oil which are very diverse like is a specific like okay we see there like we can show the most or is it a really broad piece of work at this point it's really broad um and i think to answer your first question you know before you ask that one is if you're seeking a certain bundle of nutrients in in order to satiate different needs that our body has if you know that you could have one apple with you know x number of nutrients or one apple with 2x number of nutrients we'd probably want to choose the one that had 2x the amount of nutrients and i think that's one, you know one way of looking at it is like oh can't you just eat or or if you had the the apple that had half the nutrients why can't you just eat two apples well if you begin to scale up that response then we have to double the size of our agricultural production in order to meet those nu nutritional needs of, of what we actually need and so we begin to think about not only from a food perspective but from a landscape perspective and 
again, from a quantity versus quality uh, notion of how we begin to have, you know, manage for nutritional landscapes and nutrition from landscapes as opposed to quantity from, from landscapes. And one of the frameworks that we introduced in the 2021 uh, regenerative ag and, and human health nexus paper was this idea of four different levels of interventions where level one being um, uh, replacement of can we have you know less junk food and more whole foods you know regardless of where they came from or how they were grown level two being you know can we provide foods that are free from chemical and drug inputs we know from um, Many studies that pesticides have been linked to cancer and reproductive harm and kidney disease and endocrine disruptors. And some of those endocrine disruptors are actually obesogens. They actually uh, put you on a pathway toward obesity, which is scary in and of, in and of its own. Um, moving to level three, where we have this differentiated nutrient density, and then level four being this microbiome centric way of thinking about human health and, and soil health. So there are ways to kind of move up those levels and ways in which I think there's value that can be attributed to each of the components and how we relate to them in terms of meeting basic needs now for, you know, what are you going to eat today, which is oftentimes a very different question and oftentimes a, oftentimes a near-term economic question, making sure that people are able to get food on their plates versus, versus how is that going to change health outcomes in 20 or 30, 40 or 50 years from now? And similarly, on an agricultural perspective, uh, how are you going to pay your bills and send your kids to college if you're a farmer uh, uh, versus what is the soil going to be like and what is the water going to be like and what is the climate going to be like when you turn over the farm to the next generation or the next owner? And so we're very much caught in this kind of short term, need, needing to make decisions on a short term versus being able to have the luxury of making decisions based on the long term. And David and I always kind of look over the edge of the cliff where we see the structure of capitalism as it defines many of these activities. But like we know it's down there. We know that at least as part of this project, we can't really dive as deeply as we want to into there. But I think that, you know, whether it's on climate or whether it's on food and health connections, the ability to, for investors, for farmers, for eaters to make decisions that are going to have a long-term positive effect is, is in many times much harder than meeting today's needs. And, and what would you tell investors, like sort of this is the, the lay of the land, let's say, what would you, of course, we're not giving investment advice, but let's say we're, I always like to use the example, we're doing this in a theater, we're on stage and, and the room is full of uh, um, financial types, let's quote unquote, and they get very excited, of course. I mean, you saw the, the, the announcement you mentioned, et cetera. Like, what would you, what would be your main message to them? Like, go and dig a bit deeper there or go and look there, go and read this or go and taste that or go and, and, and wait a while because we're figuring out a lot of things and maybe we're not ready for our investments or what would be your main message um, of course, asking both of you um, to to reflect on this. David, go ahead. Well, I, I have um, the privilege of not working much in the financial or investment sector, so I can say, you know, unbiased and and uh, sometimes uninformed things that I just ideas I have. <laughs> we'll see, but um, something a, a clear, I think. From a from an investment perspective, a, a value investment opportunity, a value proposition, right? Uh, opportunity for value investing is is uh, is looking at localities, places where, again, I'm going to use this word entrepreneur, where where this this proposition of what we call nourishment economics, nutrient cycling frameworks regenerative ag but there's other aspects to it like waste recycling and stuff right where where those dynamics are in place in a community and there's an entrepreneur afoot and just invest there it's like it's like warren buffett perhaps years ago buying up hilltops when cell phones were invented knowing that someday those hilltops are going to be valuable for something 
And then eventually, it turns out that all the cell phone companies want to build towers on all the hilltops, and he owns them all. <laughs> that's that was a huge investment, <laughs> a financially successful investment, right? So I'm saying go to the places where these nutrient cycling dynamics are happening, and there's a sense of agency or entrepreneurship afoot. Put resources there, even if you don't know quite what the outcomes are going to be, because there's so many local value propositions that emerge when these dynamics take off. So that's that's one idea. <laughs> um, one other one I would suggest, so again, I have these sort of perhaps unconventional examples. Um, I do a lot of work um, with the CEO of a company in Zambia called Komako. Komako is a regenerative food company, if you will, that um, uh, sells 21 packaged processed food products and sells carbon on the international markets and takes grants for elephant and wildlife conservation, right? Kamako is 20 years into its story, and we now have just over 230,000 farmers sustaining and being sustained by the company. This is not 180. This is 231,000 across 42,000 square miles of territory, right? This is a, it's a real big example. They were invited, Dale was invited to the, the, the recent climate negotiations to present this case, et cetera. And a piece of the investment story there is, is, is to see how the environmental benefits and the food system and health benefits can leverage each other financially. So in fact, in this case, we've been able to leverage carbon funding to help stand up the food production side of the company, right? Uh, through, through debt, uh, social venture, social capital, uh, not quite good enough interest rates, but, <laughs> but, but okay, right? And so the carbon and the food production are leveraging each other at fairly big scale. Um, it, it, but it took a long time to find the debt side investors for some of that because it didn't fit neatly into the box that they have on their desk smartly for good reasons saying, well, okay, but <laughs> what are the analytics here? And like, well, you got to take the elephants into consideration. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? So be willing to go there. <laughs> the value's there. It's clearly there. As an economist, I'm saying the value propositions are clearly there. It just hasn't been formalized and articulated quite yet, but invest early and realize the returns later. Um, and for you, ideas. David? Uh, agriculture is, is multifunctional. That, that, that I think we know, that I think is at least common knowledge. And so for investors, and we see many investors, and I talk to investors most days uh, at this point, who are seeking or are asking in many cases very very similar questions of I, i'm interested in food and agriculture or sometimes health uh you know what should i do and i don't give them advice that, that is not my role but I, I i'm able to lay out the landscape and uh oftentimes my advice includes you know try not to look at agriculture or investing in food systems from a singular lens because in many cases you may be disappointed if that project or that company or that landscape doesn't just give you one thing. It actually gives you a lot of different things. So knowing that that's not always the case, that there is a fund set up with a thesis and it has to do this thing in that amount of time at this return expectation is that I think that there's enormous opportunities for partnership, partnership with those other sources of capital who may have different expectations, who may want different things out of their investments. And so, you know, oftentimes we've, you know, we, from a philanthropic perspective said, you know, talk to your, you know, have a, a program officer, bring your, uh, in, you know, investment advisor to, to the same table in order to have these discussions. And I think that what we need to see more is this collaboration and, um, and, being able to have agriculture for food, agriculture for health, agriculture for climate, for water, being in discussion with each other and figuring out what these capital stacks look like that each of these different pools of capital with different needs can more effectively work together in order to fund these multifunctional landscapes and multifunctional 
companies in, in many cases. And so we know that you know, our, our report that my colleagues at Croton worked on um, a few years ago with the healthcare anchor network uh, tallied up all of the investment assets. This is pre-COVID, so these numbers might not be the same, but all the investment assets that US healthcare systems had, that was about $400 billion that was ready to be invested. So where are we seeing collaborations between healthcare systems and ag investors, and maybe it's the ag investors who want the climate and water and local economies benefit, and it's the health investors who are interested in the health outcomes. Where can we see these, whether it's pooled funds or investments, investment structures that have engaged different investors? But right now, just as we talked about the silos that we're seeing between food and health in the way in which we're at least talking about them. I think from an investment perspective, those those silos are less connected. And I think that opportunity is there to really begin to tie those together more closely. And I think an opportunity for that is, you know, some of these conferences, whether it's the next iteration of the Regenerative Food System Investment Forum or some of these other, whether it's health conferences, you know, traditionally health conferences, traditionally ag conferences, I think we need to see more blending in this space in order to find the right kinds of capital that can be able to work together. And and I want to be conscious of your time, but ask a final question to both of you. What if you had a magic wand that could change one thing in the space? Um, What would that be? Do we get the billion dollars? I know you asked that. That usually that question comes with a billion dollars, or is it just the magic? One? I mean, it usually come. Let, okay, let's rephrase. Let, no, I'm, a, a, good I'm point. a listener too, as well as being on the podcast, so I know your questions. I, I wanted to to make because that could lead up to a whole other Pandora of uh, of, of answers. So let's start with the magic wand, and then let's ask how you put a billion dollars to work, which we sort of alluded to already, but I'm still curious. No, you're right. I'm still curious about both of your answers. So let's start with the, with the magic power, which we then unfortunately take away. Um, but let's start with the magic power first. One thing only, obviously, which is always uh, a, a tricky one. Oh, that was pointing to me, David. I thought you were raising I your was hand point, to I was speak pointing first. to you. You can go first, <laughs> Mr. Strelnick. It would be something I've already mentioned, and I think we all know and the good news here is that people are working on this. <laughs> the bad news is it's really hard, which is if there were a, 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 a transactable metric that clearly indicated the nutritional results of farming in different ways. You know? So, it, and, I, and I think it's possible because of what I said about big data and AI and the way the science is headed. We're going to get to a point where, we can, where there is a number and currently, you know, major transactions happen in the world based on bulk yield volume. I want two tons of wheat, <laughs> right? And so you're and, saying there should be a two ton of wheat with this number on it, like two ton of wheat of 10 or two ton of 99, whatever. Whatever the, it is. And, and you know, I had a conversation with the, in the headquarters of the big commodity trader Bungie in Geneva eight years ago where we discussed that if there were a number that indicated the nutritional quality that they could buy and sell futures in, they would do it. But what's that number? Like it's, so I would wave the magic wand and say, Oh, here's, here's the metric. Now let's start buying and selling based on that metric. And the Backed metrics the probably, because yeah, how do you summarize all of that? What do we discuss until now in, in one number? Like it's like impact measurements in, in impact investing. We we can spend ten days on that and still yeah. get somewhere. I don't know with if frameworks. it's a, yeah. a number or an indicator or yeah. a but it's it's a something tangible where a where a buyer and seller who don't have a relationship with each other already agree on the unit they're gonna transact in. That reflects these principles. more than the price and the quantity. More than yeah. exactly, or more than the number of calories, which is sometimes how it's transacted today, or the or the weight protein <laughs> protein content or something that that but it's not an indicator yeah. of quality and that's my magic wand wish because i think it would just open up you know massive massive commerce that that is in alignment with all these principles we're discussing you know and then you're thinking that the price difference that potentially is there i'm not saying it is but is that then less relevant 
if we can add that other number to it? I think it's less relevant because, uh, again, because of this factor, we keep mentioning that all these other positive economics accompany it. So I think I think that the rewards, again, isn't sort of someone who studied economics a lot. I believe it's a belief. It's not a, an analytic conclusion that the, the economic rewards will accrue to those producers so that this, this single unit price doesn't have to carry the full cost of all of their production. And I think I think that'll become clear fairly quickly, but right now it's too messy. We don't even know where to start. It's decommodifying. To no, not even decommodifying it. It's adding a number to the commodity to make it, to, to sort of decommodifying it at the end, because you want to tie it back to, to other outcomes and to the land. Yeah. I mean, other ar- we've had arguments uh, in my team and with my advisors about, are we trying to turn nutrition into a commodity <laughs> or are we trying to decommodify, right? I'm not, I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's reflecting these principles. And, and, uh, and again, the ideas are on the table. I was, you know, a couple months ago, I was at the annual Borlaug dialogue and world food prize conference in Iowa. And I've been there before I got to chair the nutrition panel a few years ago at that event. Um, um, because of the impact that these crazy social entrepreneurs were having that was totally different than how the mainstream thinkers were attacking the issue. And there was discussion this year that there's never been in the past when I've been at the event. Not a lot of it. It wasn't on the main stage, but there was discussion of these ideas, uh, these metrics, these concepts. There was argument, whereas before you couldn't even argue with each other because you just saw the world so differently. Yeah. So how far are we off then? We're getting to you, David. But how far are we off, like, to have the data to to put a number or to put numbers or a metric or a spectrum, and there, in terms of like we we know a lot of the data on the degradation the degradation side. So how far are we on the the the, the positive side? Yeah, you know, under this U.S. Department of Agriculture grant, we've spent seven months reading papers. <laughs> a lot of reading of papers with our our colleague Andrea and um and I think I think we're not very close we're 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 able to structure the metadata now we're able to say oh these these are the structures and the data elements that matter and here's some anecdotal examples of how they change in different circumstances and so establishing your metadata is is top priority for being able to then prove the case, <laughs> but we're not there. And, and it's like in the near term, like, are we getting there? You know, sorry, go ahead, David. Mm-hmm. I, I was, it, it's, it's always funny to me that we have to prove the case and come up with metrics and data that this way of doing agriculture is healthier and safer for us and the planet for the long term, And it's, it is not the responsibility of the predominant forces of today's to agricultural system yeah. to say, mm-hmm. to prove that that way of doing agriculture isn't damaging and extractive. And that, that to me is, is, is maybe a, just a different nut to crack is that shouldn't, shouldn't we put the predominant forces of today's food system on trial to prove that they should maintain that position? as opposed to needing to demonstrate that the alternative where we have anecdotal but building evidence that this may allow us to get out of the 21st century alive and intact as a society like it seems like you know you know pardon me for for you know t- t- taking that approach and looking at the the broader picture here but um it, it always strikes me as funny I mean, it's where, where the power, the current the power lies and, and probably why well, you get a significant, but re- still relatively small grant. If you look in the grand scheme of things of where money flows and to, to, to research that. So what would you do if you had a magic wand? Would that be your, like, let's let them prove their, let's say not even positive, but not negative impact. Not negative. Oh, I mean, I only have one, so I I, I came yeah. up with this one before before we went there. We'll put that one in David's bucket. And we'll give that uh, as associated with with his one. And but I say, what what why David and I work well together is because we complement each other. So he gave you something very tangible. It's a metric data. 
I'm going to go with the intangible route um, and or slightly more intangible um, and draw from a quote from Wendell Berry where he said that people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. And so if I could, I, w I would like to change the reflection that is captured by, by that quote and what he said in thinking about how we change culture and how we can have people that are fed by the food industry, which pays attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays attention to food. And that is changing the construction of, of our society and these silos that we've built and being able to, to really think differently about how these, how the parts of, uh, of our society are, are constructed. And that's going to take changing of culture, changing of mindset, changing of, of all of these things that have become fundamental to the construction of our economic system, of our mostly capitalist society. Um, and it's maybe, maybe harder, maybe again, complementary to, to building of metrics and building of the data. But I think it's, it's the mindset in many cases that's going to be very challenging to, to change. But ultimately, if we can't change that, I think the other, the other pieces are going to be even harder. And it feels like a stretch, but I'm still going to ask the one billion dollar question. How would you put both of you put a billion? Not that you both get 500, like you both get a billion to, Ooh, to put to work better. Any long term, I mean, as investments. So in this case, I, I'm not interested in specific amounts, et cetera. I'm interested where you would prioritize, um, where geographies, but also would you focus on land? Would you focus on measurement companies? Would you focus on vertically integrated food companies? Where would you? Put your um, put your dollars uh, where your mouth is, in case you had sort of. I mean, they're not unlimited resources, but quite a significant uh, pool of capital that can do long term investments. But the intention is to have it back at some point with with a return. Could be very low, but still a return. So not not the grand side. So what would you both of you? I mean, whoever wants to take it first, what would you focus on, and what would you prioritize? This is new and a bit raw, so I need to edit this one out later. But um, over over this last break, I had the opportunity to uh, watch the what was it called the Social Network, and I've been following kind of the news around TikTok and the role of social media around really changing behavior and ultimately, I think, changing culture is part of that. So I think, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this. So how can a company that I haven't seen exist yet use tools like that that have primarily been used for, I would say, the creation of more capital and driving uh, uh, advertisers and, and other influences to change ultimately consumer behavior? What would a company look like that we can invest a billion dollars in that would work to change some of these kind of core uh, underlying components of the food system in relationship to behavior and culture look like? How can we begin to put food and nourishment and community and nutrition back as part of the dialogue as opposed to how fast can we get you the cheapest amount of click. calories possible? <laughs> And, and click, whether yeah. that's whether that's a click, but whether that you know, and yeah, eventually that's going to take land, it's going to take infrastructure, it's going to take all of these things. But how do we change the messaging? Where where are the you know where are the minds that have have been used to date to just drive capital through advertisers and social media platforms? How can we use those skill sets? to help to change the way we as a society looks at agriculture and begin to shift those value systems. That's what I want my billion dollars used for. I already wrote the investing you, in regenerative ag infrastructure paper. So all, all the other I stuff know, out know, there I is-, is <laughs> That will follow after the cultural change, of course. And you, David? So I think the, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think the complementarity, the flip side, the reason David and I will pool our billion dollars and have two billion to work on together is um, my response is I, I think of it as, as uh, parallel, but on the, on the individual actor side of the story. So who is, who is the citizen that's receiving that message? It's the same language David just used. What is the behavioral change? But um, you know, 
the great successes we're seeing and have seen for 10 years, et cetera, are the, not, not exclusive of others, but the ones we saw and said something's going on here that's really powerful is the place-based, community-based action. That you put this, this, this value proposition, this what we call our nourishment economies framework, in front of people who care about the community they live in, whether it's a little teeny community or a big 230,000 farmer community in Zambia, and, uh, and they begin to come up with and activate new ideas. Um, it's clear from our work. We prototyped an approach we called a Nourishment Economies Action Summit just before the pandemic. It was hugely successful in the couple of places we got to do it. One was in New Mexico, including with a, a number of communities on the Navajo Nation, uh, uh, but also you know traditional uh, colonial communities and others. And when you put this economic framework in front of local people who care about their community, they see these opportunities. They and and the entrepreneurs amongst them begin to bubble up. So I would I would I would I don't know if I need a billion. You know, if I if I if I had just a million, we could do some phenomenal work. But I'll take the billion and go bigger, right? But but let's let's take the 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 understanding of how the economics of nutritional relationships between soil and people, right? How that translates into clean water, good tasting food, better healthier babies, you know, carbon sequestration, more resilient landscapes when a when a disaster comes along, more resilient food systems when an economic disaster comes along, and profit for the producers. And just introduce that proposition in a million communities. We can do that, you know. Um, and 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 let the sparks fly. Um, so basically, how to somebody else said it. A shout out to Bart. Uh, how to how to cut big? How to make big money small? Like how to cut it in in a, enough small pieces to to yeah arrive in the places where it has the the, the largest impact. And, it, it, and, it, and where it has an, and I think the largest impact, I have a strong opinion on this, is, is an enabling impact. It creates a sense of agency, right? So it's not where the big money has tried to predefine what the outcomes will be and is investing in those outcomes because there, there are too many, they're too diverse. But where it really activates the local stakeholders and, and owns a piece of the pie. So whatever the pie is that they end up baking in that community, you get your piece back. <laughs> But you're not trying to predetermine which piece of the pie you're going to get because that ends up constraining the local yeah, creativity. Yeah. yeah, letting go of control, which is what many farmers need to do in this this transition as well. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to thank you both so much for uh, a proper lay of the land of where we're at in, in this moment in time in terms of nutrient density, and of course, love to check in. Um, after the two years or during the two years when this work uh, will be will be drawn to a conclusion and, and for sure there will be much a lot of work following that because this is not a two year a two year marathon this is a much longer one so thank you so much for the time today and for sharing and of course hoping to to check in um, to follow this this process along great to think through this with you thank you for the opportunity thank you so much great to be here again and looking forward to what comes next Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.